my couture quilters and couture crafters out there. It's your girl Matt Cox with MA Couture Crafting and today we are talking about the monster quilts. Yay! I love this quilt. I am obsessed with this quilt. And yes, I'm always obsessed with my, well, I'm often obsessed with my quilts, but this one here is special. Now, something that I did not realize is how much work and how much time was going to go into this quilt. I thought it was going to be a lot faster, a lot easier than it was. Not a problem. I don't care. Yes, this quilt is for charity. There is a place called Miriam's House um, that houses women who are recovering from abuse. And this is one of the only places where you can bring your children with you. And for Christmas, we like to donate quilts to the cause. Now... I was told that I do entirely too much on my charity quilts. I was told that they'll never appreciate what it is that I have done, so on and so forth. I don't play that. <laughs> Matt Cox don't play that. The people who get my quilts are getting something very, very special from me. I believe in my little happy world that whoever gets my quilts will appreciate the love and, and hard work that has been poured into them. Just because somebody is down on their luck does not mean that we give them trash, period. I don't believe in that. I am not grabbing fabrics from my stash that I don't like. I might be testing a pattern that I'm not familiar with, but I'm not going to give somebody trash. Like, that's just not what I'm going to do. It's not in my spirit. And I felt so sad that somebody would come to me and say, you're doing too much. You need to separate what you do for people who you, <laughs> who you give charity to and what you do for your family, not me. That's not how I roll. It's not how I want you guys to roll. I want to encourage you all to do the very best that you can do for even people that you don't know. You don't know how these quilts will touch people. And just giving these quilts feels amazing. It feels amazing to do this. So I have pledged to do three quilts. I'm done. Um, the bubble quilt is a charity quilt. So that's a baby's quilt. This one here would be for um, a young guy, you know, a, a boy or, or girl, you know, for in my opinion, boy or girl. And then the mother's quilt, which is going to start my fabric, my three yard quilt fabric journey. But no, <laughs> I don't feel like I did too much for somebody that I don't know. I believe that the kid that gets this is going to be so thrilled to have this quilt. They're going to keep it for the rest of their lives and love it. And if they don't, you know what, that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with what happens to this quilt after I've done it. I'm happy for the experience and I'm happy to just have poured the love that I poured into this quilt. And when I tell you I poured some love into it, I poured in a lot of love. Let me tell you some things about this quilt. I um, got the pattern off Craftsy. There's, her name is Wendy Gratz and she does a class and she teaches you how to do them. And I didn't show you everything that she taught in the class, but I do show you some things that I kind of tweaked and some things that I struggled with. One of which is she calls this a quilt as you go. I consider quilts as you go a quilt that is finished as far as the backing is concerned after you're finished doing the thing. So you do the top, the batting, and the backing, and you quilt that sucker. Her technique is fabric, batting, quilt. And I understand why, because you're doing a lot of applique work on there. However, I don't really consider that quilt as you go. Also, I don't believe in putting batting on top of, <laughs> I do not believe in putting batting on top of my machine. I'm not here for it. I believe that that's a great way for you to clog up your feet. And again, my um, my machine is, is I need it. I need it so much. I can't afford to, to break my machine. So I put muslin on the batting on the back, which allowed it to, you know, allowed it to move a little bit better. And also I wasn't concerned about the batting getting stuck in my feed dogs. Um, also, you know, how to line them up kind of threw me a little bit. And I didn't realize how much work this was going to be. I'm not saying that I would have changed anything, but I just, I didn't know. This quilt is a lot of work. I want you to know. <laughs> I want you to know. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Now, when I say a lot of work, it took me, I do quilts in a couple of days. This one might have taken me like a week and a half. Not that big of a deal. And I chose to do five by six. You can do as many monsters as you like. You could do a monster and a blank and a monster and a blank. It's just kind of up to you. Play with it. You could do some monsters and put a sash with the kid's name in the center. You can just play with this. It was so much fun to do to create little monsters. And I show you guys how I do that. Um, at the end of the day, it really is just some applique with some cool little funky twists here and there. Um, I also debuted my AccuQuilt machine. 
I love AccuQuilt. They're expensive, but they're worth it in my opinion. I show you guys how I use it for um, some of the shapes that I cut out, the eyes especially. I wanted the eyes to be round and I wanted them to be perfectly round. So I went ahead and, and used the AccuQuilt for that. And that's just a die cut machine that will die cut your fabric for you, even with a fused back on there. And it'll cut a few layers at a time. And it gives you a perfect shape, which is what I was after. For whatever reason, I did not want to be cutting. And I wanted the eyes to be different sizes and I just wanted it to be easier. And you're able to do this on the smallest AccuQuilt if price is an issue. Um, you can use the smallest one that they have. I'm definitely going to have some more AccuQuilt uh, videos coming up because I believe in that machine. I am here for it. They don't know me from Adam. I I really like this machine. You'll see. And the first AccuQuilt machine that I got was not great. It was actually, uh, it didn't work. It should go through smoothly with ease. Again, the first one that I got didn't work. I took it back to Quilt in a Day, which is the first place that I, I bought the, the small machine from. And they exchanged it no problem. I got the new one and it goes through like butter. It's perfect. So I am... Um, I really like that for this project and you can just cut out so many different shapes and they have tons of different dyes. So go AccuQuilt. Like that lends itself really well to this particular project. So if you'd like to see all the little monsters. Oh, also Ombre Fabric is your friend for this. Fabrics. Um, a gradiated fabric would be great for this particular project. I thought I'd just throw that in there. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, for hanging out with me, for watching my videos. If you found any value in this at all, please like, comment, and subscribe. I love talking to you guys, and I will see you guys on my next video. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, let's get into this guy. So I cut some squares and laid them out on my design bed because I do not have a design wall. I grabbed some warm and natural 100% cotton batting because I'm going to be heating this sucker up quite a bit and I don't want it to, um, you know, melt. So it's 100% cotton batting that I'm using. And I cut them out into squares that are slightly larger than the squares that I originally cut out. Again, this pattern is not mine, and so I'm not giving any dimensions or anything like that. I'm just kind of taking you through an overview of how this comes together. And again, you can find the whole tutorial and lots of tips and tricks uh, on Craftsy. And this would be, I think, I forget what she calls this quilt. But I'm cutting a bunch of squares from this and using up pretty much, I think I used up all this batting. Nice and easy, nothing, you know, too crazy. And I think I had just enough to do five by six. So I did 30 squares and 30 squares is a lot. You might feel like it's not, but really it is. Now I'm showing you guys how I got up all of that batting. It scratches the my mat, but I don't care because it's smooth. Um, it just takes up all that batting that gets trapped on your mat. And it's that little sander guy there. Uh, I got it from my local quilt shop. And it just kind of sands it right up. So now I'm cutting muslin. Muslin is kind of a super inexpensive thin fabric that people use to, I guess they use it to kind of do their, their draping and stuff prior to making clothes to see if the pattern is going to work before they cut into their beautifully expensive fabric. So you can get a ton of this, very inexpensive. And I just keep some around um, because in my mind I was going to be doing string quilts, but never really got around to that. So now I'm taking the square and I'm placing it on the batting kind of wonky. Just a little so that they kind of dance across the, um, the quilt. And now I'm doing the quilting. So we've got the muslin in the back. We've got the batting. And I cut the muslin and the batting the same size. And then you start doing decorative, decorative quilting. And I tried as many as I could think of, but I really couldn't think of a ton. And then I was... I really wanted to get this project going. I wanted to get to the fun part. So I grabbed a couple of different squares and did the same pattern in different colors. I played around with the thread weights with this. Some of the thread weights are regular 50 weight thread. And I did a lot of them with my 12 weight thread. There is nothing better than using 12 weight thread on a project. I love 12 weight thread. And everybody has their version of 12 weight thread. When you're using 12 weight thread, make sure you're using a 90 um, or a 14 size needle. 
and be sure that you have 50 weight in the bobbin. You do not want to put 50 weight in the bobbin on your domestic machine. And I'm just using my walking foot here and I'm doing walking foot quilting. So I'm doing straight line quilting. I'm not measuring anything. I'm not at this point, I didn't mark anything. If you wanted to work on your quilting, this would be one of the best projects to do that with because you get so, I mean, there's just so much opportunity to let your quilting sing in this project. Just get some practice. And what I like about this is I hate to quilt, but honestly, I guess I don't hate it. It's just that my, look at this, my throat is six inches. What am I going to do with that? It's not a lot of room. I'm even having trouble whipping this bad boy around. And this is not a large square. This is not the, it's not a quilt. That's for sure. And you can see that I'm kind of struggling with pulling it back and forth. Not so much so that I didn't want to do it, but this is about as big as I would try to quilt on this machine. I, I've actually quilted a full, a queen size quilt, I think, a queen or a full size quilt on this machine. It was my very first quilting experience. And I realized then that I really don't care for it. I don't like to quilt because it's not enough space. Not because I don't like straight line quilting or, or whatnot. It's just the space issue for me. So for this square, I decided to go on ahead and mark it so that I could get, you know, straight lines or even lines and just playing with different techniques of quilting. I think, again, this is a great quilt for this. And I take you guys through a lot of these blocks. So if you want to watch me on double time, definitely do that. Go on ahead and click the, the little dots and watch me on double time so that you don't have to actually see <laughs> me doing the designs. So for this one, even though I'm using a walking foot and my feed dogs are up, I'm able to get these swirly lines and I'm using 12 weight thread here. And I'm just going over the lines, just swirling and curving and playing. And it comes out pretty, it kind of gives it an oceany kind of vibe for this particular block. I did the same thing with green thread on this orange where I am stacking them. Well, actually, this one I'm not stacking. This one, they're side by side. So many different options. This is a, if you like to zentangle, you might like this. Just coming up with what you're going to do on each block was kind of fun too. I really enjoyed this quilt. Lots of lessons learned and lots of practice doing things. And again, my feed dogs are up while I'm doing this. Some of these I tested with spray basting. I mean, you really don't have to. Cotton plus cotton will grab, and the size of these is not super huge, so you don't necessarily have to base them down. Um, but I did spray base some of them just to see what would happen, and the results were fine. I got less wrinkles with the ones that I spray basted. So For this one, I'm also marking. I'm doing large, I think I do double lines on this one, possibly. I think I have regular weight thread in for this. Nope, 12 weight, just kidding. And I'm using that foot to, oh, I did three lines on these, on this guy. So much fun. I almost want to do this again, right now. <laughs> again, this was a lot of work, maybe not right now, but it was cool. So for this block, I am doing three lines. And I don't show you all 30 guys, but I do show you a couple of different variations just because this was one of the places where I struggled. I was like, but what am I going to do? What lines am I going to, what, you know, what quilting design am I going to use? And I don't have a lot of designs just stored in my head, which is strange because I Zentangled for a little while. I was in the Zentangle movement for a minute, but I couldn't think of designs. So these are designs that she, you know, kind of shows and walks you through and gives you some ideas with in the class. This one here, um, she tells you how to kind of what the, the parameters are to get a kind of design like this. So I'm just going to show you guys. I will not tell you exactly what she told us in the class, in the craftsy class. But you can see here kind of what I'm doing. They kind of look like, I thought they kind of look like fours or triangles. I did the same thing here. You see that I'm using orange thread on the blue. I loved picking these colors of thread and, and blocks. So much fun. This definitely is my kind of color story. The primary colors that lean kind of towards the, the boy side. Um, you know, I, I like it. I like it. 
Although I don't think that it just has to be boys' colors, but when you think of the blues and the greens and the yellow and the red, you kind of, well, if you're my age, you kind of think boys' quilt. And again, some of these are spray bases, some of these aren't. I don't remember which ones were and which ones weren't. And at this point, I was starting to get way more comfortable with this particular design. And this was probably my second or third one that I was doing. And like I said, don't worry, I didn't show you all of them. I think I've just shown you five. And then I'm going to show you some ruler work. I ordered some rulers from uh, Fat, Quarter, Fat Quarter Shop. I have used rulers on my when I started quilting, you'll see the YouTube video, I showed you my ruler work, but the problem was it wasn't for a low shank machine. So when I got to a particular side, I couldn't use it, which was unfortunate because when I tell you I was cooking with gas that very first time I used it, I loved the rulers. And my favorite shape that Angela Walters has is the Elvira and she hasn't done that in a low shank yet. So this one is Taj, that's the name of this ruler, and I used this on my very first full quilt and I loved it. So I thought, okay, I'll just get it now that she has it in low shank and this will be great. I don't know what it was. I fought with this, I cannot, and I'm just showing you guys this to know that I am not, you know, without being able to do stuff. Stuff does not always come out perfectly for me by a long shot. I am new at this and things go wrong all the time. For this particular um, technique, I dropped the feed dogs and I switched out my foot to that clear ruler foot so I could see what I was doing. And I'd like to say that these things helped, but really did they? Not, not so much. So now I'm like, okay, what happens if I go from this direction over? Will I feel more comfortable? And I was having issues with the muslin not sliding easily. I couldn't hold on to the fabric. I didn't have my, my gloves on, my machingers on. I'm just a hot quilting mess. But this is what happens when you're learning. This is me learning how to quilt. Although the first time that I did this, I had much better success. <laughs> much, much better success. You can see it. The YouTube video is uh, one of my first sewing videos when I tried ruler work. And it was way more successful than this is. I'm trying, I'm going over, I'm trying to figure out how I want them to overlap. I've got tons of puckers in this and I'm like, what on earth is happening? I'm uncomfortable. My body is aching and I've only been doing it for two seconds and I'm trying, you know, all the things that I can think of. Look at that. That's not even a pretty shape and Taj is such a pretty shape when it's done properly. So I was like, all right, let me set myself up better than I am now. So I went ahead and dropped those feet, made sure the feed dogs were down. And I put this mat on, which is supposed to cause fabric to not have so much friction. I still didn't get my gloves, but I grabbed my little froggy thing here, which really does work. I love that guy. And you hold them in your hands and you're supposed to be able to move your fabric. And it really does work when you're using both of them. There's, there's two in the bag. But here, eh, the struggle was extremely real. Just, just a fail. You guys are probably cringing right now, but I said that I was going to take you guys on this quilting journey with me. And this is part of my journey. And maybe one day I will be a master ruler with ruler work, but not today. So I, you know, I'm like, all right, that's, that's fun. That was enough of that. And I still use this block. And that's a little package that the little grip and stitch comes in. Those little guys love them. They really do move fabric well. I used them for another project and I had much better success than with this one. And then this is that. I'm just showing you guys how I put the Supreme slider in between that because it is kind of a sticky feel. So I quilted all my blocks and now is the fun part. This is where we put the monsters together. So I'm going through my stash of, you know, colorful prints and things. And I'm trying to kind of keep within my color story. And you have your fusible because, again, this is applique. Nothing that you guys don't know. I tried to run these through the printer because they're supposed to be printable paper. But my printer doesn't like it. It bled. It, it just didn't want to take it. And these are my AccuQuilt dies. I have a couple of different sizes of circles and I knew that I wanted the eyes to be perfectly round. I didn't want to cut the eyes. Um, I just, that was too much work. So I figured this would be a great time for me to use my AccuQuilt. 
and I have a bunch of different circled dies for my AccuQuilt. So that's how I did that. So I'm cutting some white fabric and the fabric that I used initially was terrible. It was the thinnest fabric ever. You could see right through it. That did not make me happy. So I ended up going back to the store and getting a better quality white um, and that was much better. So this is me ironing down the fusible to the, the white fabric. And then I'm gonna grab my die. And this is my die right here. And for the white, I knew that I could use all of them except for the smallest one. I, I knew that I wasn't gonna use the very smallest for the, that's the pupil. So I just shifted it down. You place it on the platform, you put this on the top and you just crank, crank, crank. It's nice and smooth. You should not have a bunch of friction when it's going in. And this is with the fusible on the back. So not a big deal. And it cut through pretty good. Um, I just pulled out the, the little circles. And then you have a bunch of circles. So if you are anal, you might want to have some baggies around so that you can put the, the sizes that you want in different little baggies. Because I was like, what did I do? <laughs> They're all together. Then I had to sort them, yada, yada, yada. So for the pupils, I could use every size. So here I'm using just the little tiny ones, but then I realized maybe I want to change the size of the eyes. And I really like that because with the Craftsy class, she gives you some patterns to follow, which is why everybody's monsters kind of look similar. You can certainly draw your own and, and get really creative with it. That's just not necessarily my forte. And I'm using up every little bit that I can. So you can see that I had a little excess with the fusible on the back. And I'm like, nope, we're going to use that too so we can get all the pupils. And we're going to cut that and probably use it again. So that's what I did with the eyes and I cut all different sizes. Now for the bodies, I'm tracing because you can see through the fusible paper that comes in that pack. And so I printed her patterns and now I'm just tracing it on the paper side. And then I rough cut the fusible and now I just grabbed a piece of regular fabric and I ironed it down after it's ironed is when I actually cut on the line and that's how I get my monster shapes and there are some options to cut the mouths on some out I mean she just gives you so many different ideas and I'm not going to go through and show you each and every monster that I did, but I am going to walk you through this, you know, one full one. So you see the eyes and then I put the little pupils in and this is a whole page of mouths and eyes that she gives you and I'm tracing a mouth. One thing that I wanted to do to keep the quilt somewhat consistent and not too crazy because it's already crazy is I wanted to be sure that all the eyes were white, all the pupils were black and all the mouths were black. Uh, for the most part, I did not want to change that because you really do need some place for your eye to rest. And this is not a resting eye quilt for sure. <laughs> I pulled in every pattern, every bunch of different colors. It's a lot to look at when you see this quilt. And there's that guy. And you can play with the eyes with the pupils. You see, you know, it just gets funkier where you, you put the pupils. Then I changed the size of the eye. Now we're doing it that way. Now we're looking down. Now we're looking at it <laughs> like that one too. Just a bunch of different ways to, to do it. So I, you know, I was like, I need to sit down and do this. This is usually I stand when I quilt and sew. So this is me sitting at my desk and I decided to, to just go somewhere and sit down and focus on getting all of my little monsters. I knew that I wanted at least 30 monsters and I'm using my little itty bitty mini iron and it works. It works to fuse down the fabric and I'm going to do a rough cut like I showed you before. And this is actually going to be the body of one of the monsters. And now I'm going to cut on the line with my regular Tim Holtz scissors. These are not fabric scissors. The other ones were fabric scissors. And I cut out tons and tons of pieces and parts because I didn't know what I wanted the monsters to look like before. I didn't plan them out that great. So I cut out just tons of pieces and I didn't have to. I have a lot of pieces left over that I don't know what I'm going to do with. I might just give those away to somebody who wants to do them or 
because I don't know that I'm truly going to revisit this project. And if I do revisit it, I don't know if it's going to be in this color story. But I just traced a bunch of bits and, and bobbles and things like that and cut them all out and then placed them on the fabrics as I was going through them. So this is a fat quarter. And I figured, hey, if you're going to use a fat quarter for a body, you can use a, a fat quarter for a couple of the, the body parts too. So I'm hoping that's making sense. I just tried to be kind of smart about it. If you're already going to have the fabric out, just go ahead and make a couple of different body parts with it too. This is, you know, me showing you the process a little bit closer in screen. And those again are printer sheets and I'm tracing them from the craftsy pattern that she gives you. And here's some more little pieces that we're just going to trace. And trace some more. And trace some more. <laughs> now, I'm not getting this perfect. I don't care about it being perfect. And one thing that I do like about these monsters is that nobody knows what your monster looks like. So nobody can say that my monster is wrong. This is also a really good project to do with your kids, depending upon their age. You might have to use the iron, but once you fuse this stuff down to the fabric, I think the kids would have a really good time putting together their little monsters. And then you can go on ahead and, well, I've seen a four-year-old, so, so <laughs> I'm not going to say your kids can't sew because I have seen it with my own eyes. So. That's how I did the um, the blocks. Now I'm going to show you guys how I did the frames. I grabbed, I think, a quarter yard cut of a bunch of different black and white fabrics, which brings me great joy. And I cut them down into strips. And I made sure that the strips were large enough to cover my square batting pieces. Again, not giving any dimensions or anything like that, because this is not my pattern. I think I did about four or five of these and then I had some some yardage. I keep a couple of bolts of black and white fabric around because it's my jam. And we'll just cut these down again. These are rough cuts. Not a big deal. Don't be all anal about it. This doesn't have to be an anal project, but in, if being anal brings you joy, more power to you. But it doesn't have to be. You're just trying to grab some strips. And remember now the fold is on the right. So I'm going to cut these down again. And you're going to need four strips for each um, for each square for the. And so then I just sorted them. And that's one square there and that's another square here. So you need to do enough of these to get. You know, 30, you know, enough for 30 uh, squares. Be careful with your fabrics that are stripes, knowing which way that they run. It's really weird when they run. Um, up and down so that you don't get like I prefer my stripes this way but sometimes the fabric runs so that you're you're cutting with the stripe and I'm like who wants to it's just strange you know people don't do stripes right in my opinion that's freezer paper so for this technique I am going to use freezer paper um, and freezer paper is cool because you can iron it down on fabric and it'll stick and then when you remove it it no longer, it doesn't leave a residue. It's just, it's cool. It's a temporary stick. And I really didn't understand the use of freezer paper and quilting the way that people use it. But now I, I get it. I didn't used to get it, but I get it now. So I cut a couple of freezer paper dots, um, circles out so that I can iron it to the fabric and then stitch around it and get very close to a, a decent circle, like very, very close to a perfect circle. So, yep, just using the AccuQuilt and cutting more eyes because that's what I need this for. And I needed more eyes. I needed more eye options. You know, monsters can have a ton of eyes. And this is also where I got the thicker fabric because the other ones I ended up just layering. I put them on top of each other so that you couldn't see all the way through them. And this is where I really wanted the freezer paper. I wanted the larger eyes because I'm going to be doing a technique where I use a, a big eye. And I need to stitch around it to make a circle and then turn it. 
no freezer paper is not going to hurt my dye. And I just cranked it. I have the bit larger AccuQuilt machine and then I have the electronic AccuQuilt machine. I just haven't ever used the other two. This is the only one that I've used and I've used this one several times. It's really great whether you're cutting out these kinds of shapes, like just nice and easy shapes. All right, so here is where I'm going to freehand one of the monsters, which is just going to be one eye. I wish that I had paid attention to where I was putting this color. But you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But I wish I had gotten more of that purple and blue and red. This is basically a green and blue and red monster. And I wanted it to be more colorful, but I am freehanding that with the rotary cutter. And we're saving some of the fabric that has fusible on the back because why waste that? And now this is where I use the freezer paper. I'm ironing on the freezer paper to the fabric the same way that you would do fusible. This fabric is doubled over. I have done this technique before to do some, um, some other applique, which is fine. Straight stitch. And I've got the open toe foot on and now I'm going all around this this big circle I realize my hand is in the way but just trust that I'm straight stitch not a blanket stitch a straight stitch now I just peel it off and there's no residue left on the paper and I did that twice this is so that I can have eyes that are that have a little texture to them so if you look at the quilt, some of them will have puffy eyes, some of them will have flat eyes, but don't worry, I show you every single monster that I do at the end of the video, if you just want to do a quick um, go through slideshow of the monsters. So I pulled that off, and now I'm going to do a little, um, I use pinking shears so that it doesn't fray. I really like those pinking shears, but they're heavy. So if you have wrist problems or hand problems, you might want to go with a pinking rotary cutter. I have that too. And I like it. But it just makes it so that it frays a little bit less. So now I'm going to snip a hole in the little circle. Pull it apart, snip a hole, pull it apart. That's important. That's very, very important. Snip a hole and then turn it. Make sure that the hole is big enough for you to stick your fingers in and actually turn it. And it wasn't big enough. And I don't have the biggest fingers, but <laughs> this is a small little circle. But you just want to flip, 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 and then grab you a little pokey tool or a, uh, not a bone folder. What do they call these? I forget what they call them in the quilt world. I call them a bone folder, but... <laughs> your um oh i can't think of the name but just use it to poke out the the holes and then go ahead and give it a nice press so that it's smooth hair marker that's what they call those my goodness i cannot think of the name and i use buttons for some of the eyes some of them i just use fusible you see to the the bottom right of the screen that's that extra sturdy fusible I didn't end up using that for this project, but I do have a little bit just in case. So now I'm going to show you me putting an actual monster down and applicating it down. And I decided to put two monsters in this particular block. And yeah, you put however many monsters you want to. You can have them interacting with each other and all that. I have them looking at each other. And for this one, I didn't do a mouth on the striped monster. I mean, he has a mouth. You can see the tooth, but I didn't do like a regular black mouth. The other guy has that. But the little monsters are just interacting with one another. And the, the, the technique that we just did where I flipped it inside out, I went ahead and um, I'll show you guys later on in the video what to do with that. 
But also, if you use it that way, you get much better coverage with that white because it's two layers. So if you just wanted to stitch that straight down without giving it any texture, it works out well too. So there's paper backing on the fusible because it's double-sided fusible. And you peel that off and you place it down. And you'll see that it's shiny. You'll see the shiny side. Make sure you know what settings to use. I struggle with the settings on my very, very, very hot iron. Matter of fact, mine gets so hot that it doesn't stick that sometimes it'll mess it up. So I have to bring my iron down to a medium heat or almost a low heat for to get good results with this. But you're going to stitch it down anyway. So, I mean, if you're worried about that, don't be. You just got to get it to stay long enough for you to be able to stitch it down. Because once you stitch it down, it's stitched down. So I hit it with the iron and no, I'm not ironing on my mat. There's a wool mat underneath. I only do this for the video nine times out of 10. I'm using the ironing board, which is behind me. So now that these guys are fused down, we can go on ahead and uh, sew them down. Applique them. Now they've been appliqued. You can see that I just used uh, some black thread. I switched out from 12 weight thread to um, and 50 weight thread. Just depends upon the look that I was going for. And now I'm lining up these strips and sewing them down and then flipping them back just like that. Line them up with the orange block and then sew them down and then be sure to line them up with the orange block and not the batting. Now I'm peeking and I'm making the batting be parallel to me you can't see it because the polka dots are blocking it but this is this is how I got that little wonky tilt because I could not figure out how to get this done it doesn't show you in the video to get the little wonky how to cut it it's very confusing so the batting is parallel to me and this ruler is also parallel but as you can see, if you look at the black and white polka dots, it's wonky inside of this. See that? See in the bottom right, it's super close to the orange. And I went around and felt to make sure that there was batting around all the edges. You can feel it. And then I trimmed. This was like the most confusing part for me because I could not figure out how to have them all dancing but be straight. And this is how you do it. So let's do it again. So you see that this is the monster and I played with this monster because I cannot figure out how I wanted this monster to look. And this will be great again for your kids. See how I have all of the pieces laid out uh, on the top of the table and then you can just pull from there and create your monster. Yeah, super fun for the kiddos. It was super fun for me anyway. <laughs> and I think that my taste is not that much different from a kid's taste. And this is what I think I settled on. My monster has a top knot with little horns coming out. And I wanted this to kind of come outside of the frame too. So you can see that the green is sticking out over the red. Now they have a little crown. So we'll peel all that off and um, go on ahead and stick that down. Peel, peel, peel. And be sure that it's not sticking over too much. Otherwise, it's going to be in the next. It's not going to be where you want it to be. You just want it to be sticking out over no more than half an inch, really a quarter of an inch over. And I'm setting this guy with the paper peeled. So now it's stuck. I did not set the horns, of course, because we're going to we're going to need to get the frame underneath that. So line up your border with the red. And press it back it's just like you're doing courthouse steps or a log cabin get that horn out the way I pinned it out of the way and then you will do this here there you go and line it up and you can see that it's not parallel to the batting and that's how you get that little wonky if I had done all of the borders in the same color you really would have been able to see it dancing around 
but this just gives it a super whimsical feel. The fact that I have all these different borders on there. In my opinion, you might think this is too much and I get it. I completely understand if you do because it is a lot as far as what you're looking at. You know, this is a lot to look at. So now I take the horns out and now we can press those down and move on and stitch it down. All right, so here's another funky monster. That looks like a nose as opposed to a third eye, but like I say, you get what you get and you do not throw a fit. So I grab some strips and you really want to make some small tubes for hair. And I could not figure out how to turn it. So this is something else that she doesn't show on her video is how to turn the tube. She says, oh, just turn it. And I'm like, how? They're super, super thin. And I have a tube turning set. But I'm telling you that tube turning set was not working. And so I went on the Facebook groups and I begged and begged and begged for people to tell me how on earth they were turning a tube when the tube was, I think I cut the tube at one and a half, one and a half inch tubes. And then you sew that quarter inch. And I'm like, come on, guys. I know that people do spaghetti straps. How are people doing this? And a woman showed me a very, very, very good idea. She told me a very good idea that actually worked. I was so happy because I had cut all these stupid tubes and couldn't turn them. They were just getting stuck and the, the sticks weren't fitting and it was just a mess. So I cut all of these strips and you fold them in half and you grab some elastic. So this is me trying the tube and I'm going to show you that's the smallest tube that will fit in there. And in theory, you put the tube down in there. And the elastic should be sewn to the side, sewn to the end of it. You make sure the elastic is longer. Sew the elastic to the side right here. Cool, right? Perfect. Now just turn it. And this is what she says in the thing. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll just turn it. So I'm cutting off the excess um, fabric and I'm pushing the pole down and it did not work. Don't worry, we will revisit that in just a second. I'll show you how I actually turn the tube. These videos are apparently out of order and because it was so long, I didn't catch it. But don't worry, we're back to how to stuff this particular monster. So we'll go around and put the borders on. Perfect. Now we're back to this eye. And we're going to make it a puffy eye with a buttonhole. Just bear with me. I'm feeling around the edges, making sure that there's batting around outside so that I'm actually getting um, a, a good quilt, uh, a good quilt sandwich. Cut it down. Now let's do the eye. And I wanted the eye to kind of be over the frame. So I grabbed some polyfill and just stuffed it, stuffed it, stuffed it. Stuffed it some more and you go little by little. This actually took a lot more polyfill than I thought, but I wanted to be sure that I could still smash it down a little bit because I wanted to kind of get a dimply feel with this button. So this is put on after I have done the frames and then you get it like a little pillow, like a little pillow hole. And I go around this time with a straight stitch and my open toe foot. And I just go all the way around using my stiletto to keep it kind of um, straight. And it gives me a nice puffy eye, which is super cute. I love that all of these have just a little something to them. Each row has got something a little different about it. You know, one might have hair, one might have a puffy eye. One might have a tooth. You know, I just tried to give it some variety. And now I'm using pearl cotton, which is a super thick thread. And I am going to, do I use pearl cotton or 12 weight? I think I'm using pearl. No, I think I'm using 12 weight thread. 12 weight thread is a super thick thread. And I go up the back and I pull the needle through and then I go back down. And after you do a couple of stitches, it kind of holds it in place and then you're good. And now you're great.
and just keep sewing it okay now back to the tube I know that's jumping around but to edit it would just be you know a little bit longer than I want to take right now <laughs> so I want to get to a quilt so we got to get through this so I sewed it down with a string in between I took that pearl cotton string and I sewed it down in between the fold then I sewed the elastic to the side and then you can pull it through with the string so I put the string on the inside I laid it on the inside and then sewed the elastic to the end the same way that I did before and then I just pulled it and it came through and that's how I was able to turn this guy because otherwise it just it wasn't turning for me and you have to kind of work with it a little bit but it will eventually come through you just want to make sure that you've sewn that string very tightly in there at the top so before I folded right sides together I put a string all the way through and you just work with it and work with it and it will come through you can actually tug on it pretty good so this is me sewing the um, the string inside see the string is in there and I did a little leader ignore that the string is all the way to the fold and then I go back and forth over that string back and forth back and forth so that the string is really sewn in there well and now I'm going to go on ahead and make sure that the string is out of the way and sew down that side making sure the string is out of the way that's important and I'm doing a quarter inch seam and then I put the elastic on the outside now we're going to sew the elastic back and forth back and forth and then when you pull it it'll come through and that's how I was able to turn it for the hair and so then you pull your elastic oh boy and then you go ahead and stitch it closed stitch the bottom you know so that it doesn't move so you pull the elastic you scrunch it up and then stitch it so that it's not going to move now you go ahead and place your eyes where you want them peel off these backings and then you're going to place the hair behind the head before you fuse anything down cut off the extra elastic and just place your little hair under the head and that way when the kids want to they can pull on it and it'll just bounce right back and then fuse everything down the same way that you would and sew around it and that guy is done now for this guy I decided to do a little bit of a flappy tongue and nothing was really difficult about doing a flappy tongue but it was fun so I cut it open so that his mouth would actually open and then I went ahead and trimmed off the sides because you need to see the mouth overhanging to get the idea that it's a mouth And I just traced a tongue shape onto some fabric and cut it out with my pinking shears after I stitched around the shape. So draw the, stage, the shape, stitch the shape, cut it with pinking shears, and then turn it inside out. And there you go. And now you have a little flappy tongue. You could certainly stuff this flappy tongue if you wanted to, to give it a little dimension, but I didn't. And then you just sew it down the same way that you did everything else. And these are all the monsters, guys. I know the bat, the, the end of this was a little bit choppy, but this was a long video and I did not catch everything. But you guys get the gist of how to put these monsters together. So please tell me at the bottom in the comments which one was your favorite monster. 
and let me know if you have any questions again this is a craftsy class and you can see how to make a lot of these over there all right guys thanks for watching with me i'll catch you on the next time all right bye-bye